So I think um, there may be others joining, but they can, I think in the interest of time, we will go ahead and get started. Um, and I wanna start with just saying, welcome to our fourth annual Turn It Around Shasta virtual event. Let's talk prediabetes. Um, we're so excited to have everyone here tonight. And it's exciting, like I had shared earlier, just that we can get people from different areas when we have it in this online format. So um, we are real excited to offer this um, to our community tonight. Uh, my name is Mary Messier, and I'm a public health nutritionist with Shasta County Health and Human Services Agency. Um, and Turn It Around Shasta is a collaborative of several local agencies, um, including the Shasta Family YMCA, Shasta Community Health Center, uh, Dignity Health, Mercy Medical Center, Reading, Shingletown Medical Center, Reading Rancheria, and KIXE. And our mission is really to increase awareness of pre the prediabetes epidemic in Shasta County. Um, and it, just to kind of share there, um, about 18% of Shasta County adults have been diagnosed with diabetes, and it's estimated that half of the adults in the county may have prediabetes. So our goal is really to look at stopping diabetes before it starts by encouraging people who are at risk to talk to their doctor and join um, a diabetes prevention lifestyle change program and make those changes early and prevent diabetes. Um, what I want to do this evening to, like I said, during any time during the session, feel free to write questions into the chat, um, keep yourself on mute. Um, and at the end of the session, we're gonna really try to answer all those questions for everyone. I wanna go over a little bit of our agenda that you see up on the screen right now um, and share, introduce our speakers that'll be talking tonight. So um, tonight there's, I have the privilege of introducing um, some of our healthcare practitioners that'll be sharing their expertise with you. Um, Irina Raybeck um, has been a diabetes educator for over 12 years, a US Navy veteran and currently works at Shasta Community Health Center as a diabetes educator for the Maternity Center and at the Chico VA as a mental health care manager. Um, she is passionate about preventative health care and health education. Her hobbies include running and hiking with her dogs and chasing a two-year-old, so keep an active. Um, she'll be speaking on prediabetes prevention and lifestyle. Um, Amy Koski is the wellness program manager at the Shasta Family YMCA. She's also the coordinator of the Shasta Family YMCA Diabetes Prevention Program. She will be sharing about Shasta Family YMCA Diabetes Prevention Program along with tips for balancing your blood sugar. We're gonna have an opportunity to hear a testimonial from Lucinda, a former um, YMCA Diabetes Prevention Program participant. In between our sessions, we're gonna be showing some brief, brief clips from PBS on your health. Mm -hmm. So as we may be switching through some of the screens or slides or maybe some glitches in technology, feel free to use that as a time to have a stretch break and just get up and stretch a little bit while we may be switching and working with technology. We're, going to have a, a smooth tech night I'm I'm hoping for because that's always the the little bit of a glitch when we're when we do it with technology um so then we'll end tonight's session um with hopefully a good almost you know half hour allowed for a, a q a with our um with our our presenters just housekeeping a couple of things just keep your microphone on mute during the sessions and again, I know I'm mentioning it over and over, but um, please type your questions into the chat for this evening. So before we have our first presentation um, from Irina on prediabetes prevention and lifestyle, we're gonna watch a short clip uh, from PBS on what is prediabetes, just to give us some background. So I will allow that to come on right now. Prediabetes is the state in your body where your blood glucose levels start becoming higher than normal, but not yet high enough to be considered full-blown diabetes. When you eat sugar, it is absorbed into your bloodstream. Your pancreas then secretes insulin, which moves the sugar into your cells to be used for energy. When you have prediabetes, your cells become resistant to insulin, and the sugar cannot get into the cells, and it builds up in the blood. One hard thing about prediabetes is that it typically has no symptoms. Risks for prediabetes are many, but the common ones are being overweight, having obstructive sleep apnea, smoking, eating a diet high in processed foods and sugars, and having had gestational diabetes. 
Having prediabetes also commonly goes along with high blood pressure and high cholesterol. The way to diagnose prediabetes is checking a hemoglobin A1C level. The best things you can do to improve or prevent prediabetes is to eat healthy foods, be active, watch your weight, stop smoking, and ask your doctor about certain medications used to improve insulin sensitivity. Okay, so um, we just wanted to use that kind of as an introduction um, for everyone. And I wanted to be able to turn it over to Irina to um, share her presentation on prediabetes prevention and lifestyle. And I will pull that up for you. So hold on one minute. Okay. Well, hello everyone. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time and um, being here um, with us. I would like to also thank the organizers for uh, having me on. Um, this is a wonderful opportunity to share with you um, um, a little bit of what I what I do. Um, so my name is Irina Rayback. Um, I've been a nurse for quite some time, uh, going on almost seventeen years. Um, and I started in a Navy as a corpsman um, and worked my way through. Um, and definitely um, by going through all these different stages, um, I realized how important it is to, um, to of course, be in good health. And um, I wanted to share with you a little bit of, of my journey with diabetes um, I was diagnosed with uh, prediabetes when I was 19. Um, I was in the Navy at a time. Um, I did not think that that would be a diagnosis that I would have to deal with just because, um, well, I was young. I uh, didn't think it would apply to me, but um, I was working nights and um, uh, I started to not feel so well, low energy and um, my provider at the time decided to test me and they found out I was actually pre-diabetic. And soon after I found out my mom and my dad had diabetes. So uh, that became a risk factor for me as well. Um, and that's how my journey to um, learn more about diabetes and um, find out how do I prevent this from turning into something even more serious, such as type two diabetes. Um, so with that in mind, um, I know that the video went over um, a little bit about prediabetes and what it means. So I'm going to summarize that a bit here. Um, uh, basically, it's higher than normal blood glucose levels. Um, and you, once you get screened, then um, you could determine, you know, if those levels are so high where it would qu um, qualify you as a prediabetic or a type 2 diabetic Um or of course, type one diabetes, if, um, if your numbers are um, incredibly high. Uh, and to, on that note, to differentiate between the, the different classes of diabetes, um, you know, basically prediabetes is diagnosed when only about 50% of your pancreas is functioning. When you're pre, uh, type two diabetic, only 25% of your pancreas uh, is functioning. And type one, it means your body does not produce um, glucose, the cells that produce the glucose um, are dying off. Uh, it's an autoimmune condition. Um, and um, of course, it's, uh, you would need insulin to, um, uh, to survive with that condition. And the last least known type of diabetes is gestational diabetes. It's a type of diabetes that happens in pregnancy. Um, now, really important about this is that um, even though prediabetes is not type two yet, it can still cause um, long-term damage to your heart, uh, blood vessels, and kidneys. And um, um, fortunately, it can be avoided by adopting a healthy lifestyle. 
Um, what most people don't realize is that prediabetes does not show any symptoms. And you know, unlike something like, let's say, a headache, you would wake up, you would know there's something wrong, and you would want to take medication. Well, with prediabetes, there are no symptoms. You wouldn't know it until you your pancreas cannot have the reserves. Your pancreatic reserves would be way too low um, and get symptomatic, and by then you would be type two. So really important to um, to uh, test early. Um, let's see. Now, there are a number of ways to determine if you have prediabetes, um, and you can do this even before um, seeing your provider. Um, one of the ways is to answer this questionnaire. Uh, you can find it at turnitaroundshasta.com. Uh, also, the CDC has this questionnaire, um, and that goes basically over your risk factors. I believe there was a question in a chat about if, it's, if it runs. Um, let me just take a quick look. Um, but I will go over that at the end of the presentation um, in more detail. Um, but for now, yes, there are uh, definitely um, quite a few factors that could uh, predispose you to prediabetes. Um, you know, these questions address all of those. And if you answered yes to even one of those questions, uh, you could be at risk. The nice thing about this questionnaire is that it would give you an actual uh, score and it will tell you if you're low or high risk. And with that, you could go to your doctor and get further tested. Let's see, all right. So of course, what we wanna do is um, look at what things, what can we do to, um, prevent uh, prediabetes or improve diabetes if we already have it. And lifestyle changes are very effective. Even if you have diabetes in your family or other risk factors, um, focusing on lifestyle changes um, could definitely improve um, progression to type two. And healthy eating is one of those things that we all know we have to do is just trying to figure out how do we get there? What exactly do we have to do? Um, important to understand that trendy diets typically do not um, help. Um, so you want to have small measurable goals. Um, you want a lifestyle change, not uh, a quick fix. Quick fixes are can be dangerous and uh, will not give you the long-term results you're seeking. Um, couple tips, as far as food goes, specific foods, um, Really with diabetes, you want to have foods that are um, low um, in sugar. And what that means is that um, you want to have, you want to have carbs, but you want healthy carbs, such as whole wheat, whole grain, um, lentils, beans, chickpeas, just to give you some examples. Um, those foods are, um, they do not rise your blood glucose fast. They are doing it slow, slower than for example, white flour or um, just um, um, things such as pastas, um, white flour pastas and pizzas and things like that would, would spike your blood glucose faster. So processed foods would do that where whole grain, whole wheat will, will not, will do it much slower. Um, all veggies, any kind of veggies, either raw or cooked, will have that effect as well. Um, increase your blood glucose slowly, giving your body enough time to respond to that increase, um, therefore being a healthy choice for you. Um, and try not to set yourself up for it to fail. So if you have a certain weakness to a particular type of food, I don't know, let's say chips, that's mine at least. Um, try not to buy it in bulk and bring it home. It is hard to resist the temptation that is right in front of you. Um, another tip would be don't drink your calories. Um, so focus on, you know, water, fizzy water if you must, but um, avoid uh, juices, um, you know, caffeinated drinks with lo lots of sugar, creamer, things like that. Okay. Um, another tip. Um, Exercise can definitely help um, by doing quite a few things. One, lower the blood glucose as soon as you start exercising. Um, it's more effective if you do at least 20 minutes, but studies show that even 10 minutes of exercise can have a huge impact on your blood glucose. Um, so, you know, we can just doing little things like 
you know, park your car further when you're going to a grocery store or picking up your mail, but go a little further, um, then you have to go to the next house, turn around, just add another few steps that can, all of those little changes can, uh, can improve uh, your chances um, of preventing diabetes. Um, also exercise can increase muscle mass. Um, so muscle mass increases metabolic rate. So you end up burning more calories at rest. Very important. Uh, and we know that just losing 7% of your body weight can improve blood glucose levels and reduce the risk of prediabetes by 60%. So again, exercise, very significant. Now, I have stress management as third on my list here, but honestly, I believe it should be top, top of the list, um, even before food, because if you are stressed, you are more likely um, not to follow through with the rest of the things that you know you should be doing. If you're under stress, nothing else really works well for you. Um, and the reason stress is so dangerous, um, you know, our, our bodies, our brains haven't changed as much. So in a primal sense, if you feel danger, whether it's perceived or actually, you know, an animal chasing you, which would have been the case back in the day, our bodies still react in the same way. The difference now, our stress happens sitting down. So when we are stressed, our um, fight or flight response is activated. And um, immediately your pancreas, um, sorry, your um, liver is going to release sugar to allow your muscles to react and take off for a run because we're stressed. And that stress implied moving away from danger. And... <clears throat> that type of uh, reaction is going to uh, continue to stress your pancreas. Your pancreas is going to release insulin in response to that surge of sugar, trying to uh, normalize things. And this type of stress over and over will lead to uh, diabetes as well and other inflammatory conditions. So managing stress is incredibly important. Um, and there are a number of things that you could pick. Uh, of course, you have to take some time and think of what would be most beneficial for you, but try new things such as yoga, tai chi, meditation, acupuncture, walking your dog, any, uh, any one of those things could, uh, could be helpful in managing your stress. Uh, and uh, sleeping is another factor. Um, Nurses have been studied on this particular one. So what they found out is that if, you know, for nurses that work nights, for example, for more than six months, they ended up, um, a large percentage of them uh, ended up with prediabetes. So not having a good sleep can most definitely affect your chances of prediabetes. So really important to develop good sleep hygiene. Um, and low blood glucose and high blood glucose can cause sleep disturbances, uh, and cause and manifest as nightmares. So it's really um, uh, a cycle there. Uh, you can get sleep disturbances from diabetes and you can cause diabetes by having sleep disturbances. And just to complete that circle, lack of sleep can happen from, you know, lack of exercise, lack of, um, you know, increased stress, um, poor diet. So it's all connected, really important to know that. Another lifestyle change that is very important is, of course, avoiding smoking and alcohol consumption. Um, uh, smoking alone can increase chances of developing diabetes by 40%. And for type 2 patients, it makes it much more difficult to control. Alcohol um, causes inflammation, pancreatitis in particular, and that can also interfere with your, interfere with your body's ability to make insulin and lead to type 2 diabetes. So very important to consider that when trying to prevent prediabetes. Um, another tip I would say in this day and age, technology could be um, of great help in, um, in helping us develop a routine. Uh, Amy's going to uh, talk a bit more about tips um, uh, on how to um, create a healthy habit. Um, but I thought I would add this in here that quite a few apps that can help you on your journey uh, to better health. And summary, 
it's really important to determine your risk factors. Uh, that, um, that little quiz can definitely help um, in giving you an idea where you're at. Your doctor, of course, is a wonderful resource. Um, you need to figure out your why. I think in this day and age, we have a lot of information. The issue really is with um, finding out why is it that we want to be healthy? What does that mean to us? What does health mean? means to you in particular. Um, another important factor to consider is, you know, quick changes uh, are not going to be beneficial. So we want to focus on long-term goals that are manageable and measurable. And equally important is identify a support group. It's difficult to make changes 100% on our own. And we want to identify our family, friends, or healthcare team that can help us achieve those goals. Well, thank you very much with this. I will pass it on to Amy. Okay, hold on one sec. We will be just switching. So this is a good stretch break time. We're going to um, just be switching some of these around. And you could stand up, but before we, um, before Amy does her presentation, hold on one minute and hey, all right, sorry, there's just always a little bit of technology we have to work our way through. Um, so before we show our food demo, we're going to be showing a short clip from PBS on nutrition and lifestyle. I want to say thank you first, Irina, for that great presentation, and I see some questions coming in into the chat. So we will have those questions um, at the end of our session, we'll be answering those. So um, we'll go ahead and show the clip from PBS on um, how good nutrition can affect your lifestyle. And then we'll go right on to our Veggie Delight food demo. What does health mean to you? Is it strong daily energy, a clear and sharp mind, physical stamina and endurance, healthy glowing skin, a body free of extra weight, or a strong immune system? Every moment of everyday life, we are presented with choices. These choices can either impact our health in a positive direction or a less positive direction. Having good health is an active process. As they say, what we do every day matters more than what we do once in a while. We actively contribute to our health and well-being through our daily choices, which over time become our habits. Habits start with daily action. What is one thing you can do for yourself today? Can you drink an extra glass of water? Can you take 20 minutes to move your body? Can you lovingly prepare yourself a balanced meal? Can you sit down to eat at a table? Sound nutrition affects every cell in our body. Focus on eating whole, unprocessed food that is full of nutrients and does not contain added chemicals, added sugar, or preservatives. Keep it simple. As Michael Pollan says, eat real food, mostly plants, not too much. This means a diet full of plants, clean protein, and healthy fats. What are healthy fats? Avocados, olive oil, nuts, seeds, and fatty fish like salmon. What we focus on increases. So rather than focusing on what not to eat, focus on what to eat, a nutrient-dense, properly prepared, whole foods diet. This is very simple to make. You just get the peppers and the eggplant whole on top of the grill and let it just turn. You can do it different ways. You can do it directly on the fire or in the oven. Once the peel is kind of black, dark, then you let it cool down and then you peel it. I open them first so that the whole oh, kind of juice. fluid, the juice come out. And then you have all of these seeds in the middle to take out. Then, then it's just peel. Very easy. Just peel it. Make it in little strips and put salt and olive oil. 
you could put garlic if you like it. This one is the eggplant here. This is the eggplant. Sometimes this one has a lot of seeds. It's better to use eggplant with less seeds. And when it's cooked, you peel it, cut it, and put some onion and parsley, salt and olive oil. That's it, very simple. And it's very tasty, it's good. The only thing is that it, it is warm. When you finish, it's warm and you cannot peel it. You have to wait. To so usually cool. I do the eggplant the day before. These beans, we soak them first with water overnight and then we cook it with garlic and with some bay leaves and then just to add some flavor to it we put some rosemary in little pieces and fry it. The Brussels sprouts we cut them in half so they are easier to cook. Put some olive oil, garlic. There are some pine nuts. You could do it with walnuts. You could do it with other kind of nuts. And then fry it. Uh, add some salt. That's it. So is anyone else getting hungry on that one? <laughs> that one looked really good. Thank you. Those were some great. And I think Julie put into the chat um, for us where you can find um, more of those um, recipes, the website there, and you can find more of that. Um, but we thought that was a really simple, easy um, recipe of just roasting some, ve um, some veggies that we wanted to share with everybody too. So um, just wanted to share that with you. So what we will do now, um, I think at this point, we're just about, um, we're about a half hour um, into, our, into our session. So I thought I would give um, us a chance to do a little bit of a, a stretch break. And then I would turn it over um, to Sharon Howland. Um, she's a Shasta Family YMCA Wellness and Programs Manager. So I will stop sharing this screen so that we can all um, see her and what she's going to be doing today. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, like Mary said, I am Sharon Howland. I am the Programs and Wellness Manager here at the Shasta Family YMCA. I also wear many hats. I am a diabetes prevention coach, as well as being a personal trainer and a group fitness instructor. So today we're just going to stretch together. Um, probably all heard that you need to get up and do stretch breaks every once in a while. Um, so we're going to sit up nice and tall. You can do this from your chair. So if you spend a lot of time sitting, this is going to be really helpful for you. We're just going to roll our neck around five times in one direction. And this is really good for releasing stress as well, because we hold a lot of stress and tension in our neck and shoulders. Go ahead and switch directions. So I know a lot of us might have desk jobs. I'm pretty much so in front of my computer eight hours a day as well. So um, I like to do these about every two hours, I try to get up and get some type of movement. All right, we're gonna do a rich wrist stretch. Go ahead and pull those fingertips back, palm forward. We're gonna take about 10 seconds here. Breathe through it. So when you're stretching, the breath really helps. Go ahead and flip it over. Being sure to Breathe deep and even, getting that breath all the way down into the diaphragm. Go ahead and switch. Also, if you breathe in through the nose and breathe out, switch through the mouth, that activates your vagus nerve, which runs all the way down your spine, also helping to relieve stress and tension. So we're gonna do a spinal rotation next. So I'll scoot back a little so you can see me. You can always use your chair and just rotate, hold and gaze over your shoulder. 
Continuing to breathe those deep breaths. And then on your next inhale, come through center. On the exhale, rotate and twist. And we'll inhale back to center. Let's go ahead and show you something that you can do for your shoulders. Let me push this down. So if you would sit at a desk, you can always take your hands on the desk and just roll your chair back and lean forward. Make sure your chair doesn't roll away from you. You could also do this standing. This feels really good on your hips. And let's come up. Speaking of hips, let's do something for our hips. So you can take one foot over. Option to add a little pressure. It depends on how tight your hips are to begin with. And then just lean forward just a touch. And that should feel pretty good through the hips. Maybe it hurts just a little in that good way. Because sometimes stretching doesn't always feel the best. So if you're pretty tight, then um, stretching can feel like a workout in itself. <laughs> so that's why yoga is always a great beginner workout. And even for the more experienced person, sometimes yoga can be challenging, but oh, so good for you. All right, our last thing, we're just gonna take a foot. You don't have to raise as high as me. And we're just gonna rotate that angle around. I'm just bringing it up this high so you can see it. Because even as we're sitting, we don't wanna forget our feet because our feet are still needing that movement. Go ahead and switch sides. So we've worked all the way from the top, down our bodies. And we should be feeling a little better. So even if you can't get up and move around every two hours, like is recommended, you know, that 10 minute walk break is highly recommended, but even if you can't get it, you can do this. All right, thanks guys. Right. Thanks, Sharon. That was great. And always just moving around like that and stretching our body really helps, especially if we are at our computers and we are at a desk um, for long periods of time. Um, you know, just even standing up and just doing some really quick stretches every hour, they suggest now for maybe, you know, just a couple of minutes just to get up, either walk around or just do some of those stretches. So thank you, Sharon. That was great. Um, so at this point, Point, I am going to um, be turning it over um, to Amy. Um, she's going to be talking about some tips for balancing your blood sugar. She's a health coach and wellness programs coordinator for the Shasta Family YMCA, also the coordinator of the Shasta Family YMCA Diabetes Prevention Program. Um, and so I am going to turn it over to you, Amy. So hold on one second and you can take it over. There we go. All right, thank you everyone. Great to have you all in here. Sharon, that's great. I should have um, a stretch break before I talk anytime. So feeling relaxed and good. Um, so today I'm gonna talk about 10 tips for balancing your blood sugar. A uh, great topic for holiday season or really any time. Uh, maybe you feel like this woman looking at the donuts, um, craving sugar. Uh, this is the talk for you. So uh, yeah, whatever time it is, our bodies are still needing care. And so I'm gonna go over some tips for giving some care to our bodies and balancing our blood sugar. So this is a familiar um, mechanism that I, I've seen in my family. Um, even as a kid, I just remember family members needing to test their blood sugar and diabetes runs in my family. And uh, it was one of the motivating factors for getting me into the health and wellness field. So I'm a health coach and 
I love seeing people change um, through baby steps, little steps towards getting them to the healthier, better feeling um, place in their life. So you might have had different tests done. We um, often look at the A1C test when we're talking about diabetes. Um, we really want you to be in this healthy below 5.7 range. The A1C is a great test to know where we're at if it's prediabetes or diabetes uh, because it will track your blood sugar over a, about a two month period. Whereas you might be more familiar with the fasting blood sugar numbers where that is after having no food or drink um, and seeing where you're at. Um, we're really wanting it to be uh, below 99 or below and then once it's over 100 uh, it tells us that something might be up. So we have, we gave these numbers, oops, um, with diabetes. So how many Americans are living with diabetes? That's one in 10. Um, and then those with prediabetes is about one in three as a national average for adults. And in Shasta County, uh, we've estimated that it's actually much higher than the state and the national average. We're, we're estimating about one in two adults having prediabetes. And about 80% of those people don't actually know that um, they have prediabetes. So we're really wanting to target some lifestyle changes to prevent or delay uh, the onset of type two diabetes. So first tip, being smart about carbs. And that is so important because carbs are one of the things that turns into sugar. So um, our body turns most food into sugar and releases it into the bloodstream. And when the blood sugar goes up, it signals our pancreas to release insulin. Um, and insulin is like that key that unlocks the body, the cells to um, utilize that sugar energy or sugar into energy but when the body is not functioning um, as it should in the prediabetes or diabetes ranges um, those cells aren't able to um, utilize the sugar and so the the sugars are high and so one way that we can do that is being smart about what we're putting into our body and one of the, th the things that we can target is carbs so um We've had, you know, maybe younger growing up years um, and early adulthood seeing that we can eat kind of anything we want. Um, and then it's usually um, catching up with us in adulthood to realize, oh, okay, I can't eat that many um, pieces of pizza or go out this many times a week. And so uh, weight gain is one of those uh, signals or flags to us that something um, the body isn't processing food as it used to. So some smart carbs would be non-starchy vegetables, things like broccoli, mushrooms. Um, we see some great salad things on the table there, um, great colors. Um, and then a whole other smart carbs would be whole fruit, um, whole grains, oatmeal, whole grain bread, whole grain pasta uh, for healthier swaps that have higher fiber. And the not so smart carbs are, you know, not that we're going to drink a, a cup of sugar, but um, the World Health Organization recommends that we get only five to 10 grams of sugar. And the average American adult, do you guys know how many grams? A sugar um, is consumed. I've seen different estimates between 70 and 126 grams a day. And so that is just a huge difference between 5 to 10 grams to up, to, up in the hundreds of grams, um, overloading our body with carbohydrates in the form of um, sugar. So that could be in our flavored coffees, soda, sauces, low fat yogurt, uh, so many different things. 
And so sugar is super addictive. So really looking at ways to start cutting out and being aware of what is in our food. So if it's a boxed um, or already prepared food, you're looking on the label for those ingredients and seeing if sugar or one of the forms of sugar is in your label. Because when we have a little bit, I have this little this syringe because it's so addictive. They've done studies with rats where um, rats will go back to sugar um, over cocaine. So um, it's giving them a better hit than, than, a, than an actual drug. And so getting off of those processed foods with lots of sugar, because when we have a little, we want a little bit more. And when we have more, we want more. So it's a cycle. So getting out of that cycle. And one way to do that is really planning ahead for these cravings. So having some great options, cut up veggies, fresh, um, fresh items, nuts, uh, seeds, whole grain crackers, um, things that are your you have ready to go to when you open up the fridge or you have it um, your workstation or throughout the day that you have something that you're going to go to easily that's a healthy option over um, maybe a, a boxed food or a canned or um, already prepared or fast food that's going to have um, uh, extra sugar and and oils that are unnecessary. And really our body doesn't know the difference between if it's really craving water or if it's craving food if we're dehydrated. So um, we find that often um, most of us are dehydrated. We're not getting the water that we're needing. So our body is signaling to us, oh, you must need another cookie because you're thirsty. So really um, just going to the, the water first. And really just drinking water. So many beverages are sold out there that have so many extra calories, sugar, um, and fat in them when really like, are you like thinking about even our pets, like we just give them water, right? We're not giving them a soda because they're thirsty. We're giving them water. Like our bodies, we're mammals, we need water. And, um, you know, we've had, we have different estimates of how much water we need, but really most everybody needs more water. Um, uh, one estimate says women need 11 and a half cups of water a day. Men need 15 and a half cups. And so we have further to go in, in our water consumption. And then really looking at our portion sizes. A uh, portion is so important, really like a portion of meat is the size of a deck of cards. A portion of pasta is a half of a tennis ball. Um, you know, thinking about your restaurant or normal at home, um, portion sizes are a little different than what we um, are needing to actually look at. And one of the things that we do in our diabetes prevention program um, is looking at how do we do a healthy eating plate? How do we figure out what to actually eat? And so one of the tips is eating more vegetables, um, getting um, really, if we're looking at a diabetic plate, half of the plate being um, fruit and vegetables. And when we're in diabetes, we're cutting out that fruit and putting that into the green category. So half of our plate is really um, vegetables. Because each veggie has a different beautiful color that has a different uh, micronutrient in it that our bodies need. We need that variety. And really, I always tell people, if it gets in your grocery cart, then it's going to go home with you and be a temptation. So really wisely choosing what's going to go into your grocery cart. And we're just really trying to uh, minimize processed food about 60 percent, I heard even upward to 90 percent of uh, processed food has sugar in it. Uh, so really uh, to balance our blood sugar, we really need to uh, minimize those processed foods. And getting that activity in, um, getting up to those 120 minutes a day. 
I'm sorry, 150 minutes a week with um, two days of muscle strengthening activity. And another thing to look at is supplements. So you want to talk to your doctor about um, if you're getting the right amounts of nutrients. One thing to check with your doctor is vitamin D. Even in sunny places like Reading, um, I myself found that I was low in vitamin D even in the summer. And so finding um, ways to supplement ourselves with nutrients that we need. And vitamin D is one of those great nutrients that's important in balancing blood sugars as well. And we talked about, uh, Irina hit on quitting tobacco. There's so many great resources out there. The quit line, there's apps even for quitting tobacco. Um, it is just one of those um, lifestyle habits that really um, tend, lends towards um, inflammation and then leading towards prediabetes and diabetes. And, um, you know, waistline goals, we want to look at that waistline for telling us um, where our health is at. Um, men, if you're over 40 inches and uh, non-pregnant women, if you're over 35 inches, um, looking at um, some healthy ways of losing weight. So just with all that, um, I want you to think through one thing that just stands out and one small thing that you can change this week. And I'd love it if anyone could uh, type the, that one thing into the chat and, um, and even think through one person that you're gonna share that with. Now I talked about our diabetes prevention program so important um, for Shasta County. We have a year-long lifestyle change program that helps people make those small incremental changes with a group that's going to support you and a lifestyle coach to go with you for the, that whole year as we go through ups and downs, holidays, stressors, and figuring out healthy ways to deal with that. We do have a great crew. Um, this is one of our cohorts enjoying each other. Um, we have an info session that's going to start January. It's going to be at January 11th, and we would love to have you there. It's just an hour where we're going to talk about our program, and there is a Zoom option. So I'd love to see you there. Uh, please RSVP. Let me know you're going to be there. I can send you uh, the link if you want to get on Zoom with that. And um, and here's my contact information if you have any more questions about prediabetes or prevention or health and wellness. So thanks, Mary. Great, thanks, Amy. Is that good time to take that stretch break while we switch our screens and just stand up a little bit and And then one second, yeah, take that stretch. Thank you, Amy, that was really um, great. I love some of those real colorful slides. And that's the one thing, you know, we, you promote, we all promote more fruits and vegetables and they're so easy to promote because of all the colors. I mean, it's just fruits and vegetables can be beautiful. You set up the plate and all the different colors um, of, you know, of the rainbow and, and fruits and vegetables and, um, it's just, it's really, really pretty to see. Uh, so next, what we're going to be doing um, is sharing a testimonial from Lucinda, who is a past um, participant of the YMCA Diabetes Prevention Program. So we're going to share, share that next. Oh, and I'll, you know, okay, I think that's good. I don't have to stop sharing. <laughs> My name is Lucinda. When I joined the YMCA Diabetes Prevention Program, I was joining a support group. In my mind, we were a group of people going the same direction. We had similar goals. We had a life coach who gave us tools and strategies. We had daily disciplines of keeping food journals, activity journals. We were counting fats and calories. 
but it was more than just a discipline. We were changing our lives. And all of us had to figure out how we were going to celebrate life without defaulting to indulging our appetites. Um, finding ways outside of eating a candy bar to celebrate a successful day and how to deal with a bad day rather than eat the candy bar for a bad day. Um, do something else to uh, lift our spirits like take a walk on the bridge or paint our nails a fancy color. Whatever it would take to keep us in going the right direction. In that support group environment, um, you ended up rehearsing what you did and others could benefit, you would benefit from them, um, hence the support group. Thank you for that reminder. Um, it's always exciting to hear from someone who's, um, you know, had an opportunity to be in a program that's helped them to make lifestyle um, changes. And sometimes that, oftentimes that group participation, doing it together, um, you know, working with each other and kind of the ups and downs as you kind of go through making some lifestyle changes. It's really helpful to be doing that with others. Um, so where we're at right now, it's just about almost 6.30. And so I wanted to make sure we had um, enough time for all the, the questions that have come in. So what I'm gonna do at this point is um, maybe all of our presenters can um, just you know, open their video up as they uh, you know, will be answering questions. And I'm going to be pulling those up and just kind of and people can continue to write in um, more questions, but I'm going to um, start looking through and asking some of those questions. So hold on one minute um, and I will start. And we can really, um, you know, any any of our, either of our presenters that there's, um, none of the questions are necessarily specific um, to a particular presenter. Um, at, at this point, so wh whomever would like to um, chime in and share, that would be great. So hold on one minute. And the first question that I have is, does di prediabetes run in families? Um, hi, this is Irina. I will uh, tackle this one. It's such a great question. Um, diabetes definitely can have a genetic, uh, component. So yes, uh, it can. Um, but there is a lot more to, um, to discover. Um, it, it depends on, you know, both lifestyle and, um, um, genetic factors can, can influence prediabetes. But uh, the, the short answer to that is yes. Yes, it definitely can. Does that answer the question or more, is there more, more detail needed there? I'm not sure who asked. Yeah, I think that's fine. If more questions, if um, those that asked the question want to continue, I will um, start from the questions that were asked in the beginning. So we can have some follow-up questions um, that are continued to add into the chat if, um, if there's more on that. Um, so I will go on to the next question right now. And um, how do calories impact prediabetes? Um, do they affect type one or type two? You might want to tackle that more, Irina. Okay. <laughs> I was about to ask. I'm, I'm fine either way. But um, so calories, excessive calories lead to weight gain. So in that sense, um, calories definitely have an impact on, you know, it, you know, weight gain is a risk factor for all types of diabetes. So we have to look at, at fat as being metabolically active. And what that means is that it can make you more insulin resistant. So 
as your body's producing um, insulin is not as effective in a body. It will not lower your blood glucose um, to the level, to a normal level. So, so yes, ca excessive calories leads to weight gain. Weight gain is a factor um, in insulin resistance, um, which affects all types of diabetes. Um, type one is a little different in that um, it's an autoimmune disorder. So it does not, you don't have insulin resistance with type one, uh, but you can still gain weight and it could still have an effect um, just the same. It's just a bit more of a complex question there. Thank you. Um, and the next question is, if you've been diagnosed with gestational diabetes, will that increase your risk? And I'll just put in there too, maybe explaining um, what gestational diabetes is. Yeah, so let me take that. It's up to you. If you like to answer this one, Amy, that's fine as well. I can tackle it too. Let me know. Would sure. you like to take it? So gestational diabetes is another form of diabetes uh, that when you're pregnant, the, the body is having a, a basically a diabetic response. Um, so if anyone has had a baby that's over 10 pounds um, or was diagnosed as gestationally diabetic, that does put them at a higher risk factor for developing type 2 diabetes in the future. And if I could add to that, Amy, the, the statistics for that is if you... Um, if you've had gestational diabetes, you are more likely to develop type two, uh, or 50% of the women diagnosed, they're more likely to develop type two within uh, seven years of diagnosis. That's just, so it definitely, it's huge prevalence. So yes, absolutely, Amy. Yeah. Good point. Yeah, these are all, all the different type, or, you know, the type two and the prediabetes and the gestational diabetes are, are really interconnected. Because someone that um, is in the pre-diabetic uh, range, they say within uh, one to five years, someone can move into that diabetic range too. So uh, watching those lifestyle habits uh, are really key for prevention. So the next question, um, Amy, this one is directed to you. You mentioned supplements. Was there a particular brand you recommend, um, I think you just mentioned um, the importance of vitamin D. Um, yeah, so as a health and wellness coach, I do not um, prescribe anything or even recommend brands, uh, but I always say, do talk to your uh, doctor about that. They will have some great recommendations for you. Um, and then, you know, our food is really a great source for, of nutrients too. So, and the sunshine is, uh, is really our best source of vitamin D, although in the winter it is a, a little harder to get, but um, other sources for vitamin D would be fatty fish, um, cod liver oil. Um, but yeah, talk, talk to your doctor, um, or if you have a nutritionist, talk to them about particulars on those. Mary, maybe you um, wanted to kind of hit on that as well. Yeah, sure. Um, I think I'm making sure I'm not muted. No, good. Um, it, it, I think I, I agree with you on that. Um, sometimes it's hard, especially in the winter time, to get enough vitamin D. Um, but we do want to, you know, look at food sources first, and um, you know, fortified foods will have vitamin D. You know, um, some dairy products. Um, will have vitamin D fortified in it, like you said, fatty fish. Um, but sometimes supplements are reasonable. It's just, um, and vitamin D is one that's hard to get enough, especially in, in the winter time when you're not getting the sun. But I think that's another piece of getting outside and exercising and being out, you know, outside so you can get that, but it, um, and your skin will produce the vitamin D that you need with some some amounts of skin exposure. I think sometimes what happens um, with vitamin D in particular is we, we're so much about um, a lot of sunscreen, which I know we need to prevent 
the um, the damage, you know, on um, skin cancer and, and use a lot of sunscreens, but sometimes we do need, um, you know, like 15 minutes of exposure to sun for getting that vitamin D, which is really important. And that's why getting out and being active, walking and being able to do things like that gets you outside. So the next one is, um, there's just a question in general about um, what's the best diet for, um, I'm assuming, for preventing diabetes. So I know we talked about several things, you know, in the presentations, but if there were to be um, a couple of, you know, like first recommendations. So if you were, you know, to, to come to the top of your mind, one or two things, maybe both of you could answer, um, you know, give a couple of suggestions for this as to, you know, what, what are the, the top thing that you would have somebody to take away or to remember about what they should do with their diet in order to prevent diabetes? Um, I would say, um, do your best to avoid processed foods. And that would include avoiding fast foods, um, sodas, things that have um, a long shelf life. So the way I look at it, you know, if you were to do an, uh, a little experiment and you took fresh strawberries, let's say, and a slice of pizza and you leave them out on a table, um, you would and come back 24 hours later, you know, the strawberries would already have mold on them where the pizza would not have anything grow on it. it I, actually, it takes weeks, if not months, depending on what type of pizza you pick to develop any kind of mold whatsoever. This is an experiment. I had to do in college, but, but it's interesting because really if the bacteria does not want it, does not grow on it, you know, it makes you question, how is it actually processed in your body? Um, so it doesn't, it lacks nutrients if it doesn't grow bacteria mold, right? So, uh, definitely avoiding processed foods would be, um, key and trying to incorporate as many you know, real foods as possible, your, you know, raw veggies, um, whole wheat, whole grain, um, and just think of really a percentage of it. It's not that you could never have something that you crave, that, that you know it's not great for you. So at least you have the knowledge that you're, you're doing it because you have a, you know, you're doing it for the taste, not for the health of it. <laughs> so you don't want foods to be taboo, but at the same time, you want to make sure you make, uh, you set yourself up for success each day and incorporate as many real foods, whole foods as possible. Um, examples of that diet would be like a Mediterranean, um, Mediterranean diet or plant-based diet. Um, I could say from personal experience, those um, have had some success for me. That's great. I would, I would echo what Irina just said. Uh, yeah, crowding out, I like to call it uh, those processed foods with the good. Uh, so not necessarily focusing on what you don't eat, but replacing those things that you're not eating with some great options of fresh, um, fresh veggies. And yes, I've seen great results also with the Mediterranean diet. Um, and yeah, just getting more um, living foods that that will grow the mold, not the, <laughs> the McDonald's or I've seen the McDonald's experiment where they do, you know, your like whatever meal and put it under glass and see that it takes months uh, to grow anything on it. Whereas if you homemade any of those foods that it would take, you know, a day or so to notice that it should have been refrigerated or eaten. I, I think, Amy, um, the experiment you're talking about, was that uh, part of the uh, documentary called Super Size Me, I believe? Gosh. Is that is that what you're referring to? I, yeah, and I've seen it in other places as well, but yeah. it's like, um, Super Size Me. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's, or it's that Twinkie that will last a year. I think they mm. had somebody had a Twinkie that lasted over a year, and it's a food. It's kind of, yeah, that's, that's not what you want. I think one thing that you... Um, shared to uh, Amy, you know, I think that it is a good thing to 
to look at with water, you know, focusing on getting more water and those sugary beverages um, and even, you know, diet sodas. Um, I, we don't liquid calories. We often don't um, realize those calories. Our body doesn't register that. Our brain doesn't register uh, the feeling of fullness from the liquid calories that we can get. And um, so really focusing for your beverage doing waters or unsweetened teas possibly, but really having that focus on water, um, I think is one thing I know I need to always think about drinking more water. I may drink all day, but I'm not drinking water. Um, I mean, I'm not maybe getting as much water because I'm just maybe sipping water. So just trying to think about um, drinking more water. Yeah, one thing that I, I have is like a water bottle constantly and I'll know like how many ounces are in it. And so I'll say like, okay, I need to have this many before lunch and this many before dinner to know that I'm hydrated for the day. Yeah, that's great. Um, so I will add in a couple of questions and we'll probably wrap up our Q and A time and anyone else that wants to add questions into the chat, Feel free to do that right now. I know I think um, Julie is putting in some resources, um, some good resources of, about some recipes and um, you know just some uh, uh, healthy eating tips from the Diabetes Association, from Champions from Cha uh, for Change, and our Turn It Around Shasta website. So those are also some resources um, you guys can grab. Um, but there's one, a couple of things that I wanted to to ask that the group might be interested in is um, how can prediabetes and diabetes impact our mental health? Um, and what, what can we do, you know, why is mental health, um, you know, in prediabetes an important thing to be aware of? And what are some things that we can maybe do um, it, to help that, to improve our mental well-being? Um, Amy, is it okay if I take this one or would, would you like to? to tackle yeah, it. Right. Okay, so um, I mentioned this in my presentation. Um, I touched on stress management um, for this particular reason. It, um, it really, it has a huge impact on everything else. Um, so if the command center is not working well, nothing else will. Uh, this is plainly, plainly put. So um, you are gonna have a hard time keeping motivated, staying on task, um, if you're feeling anxious or depressed or just not being able to, um, uh, to maintain your attention on any particular task. Even something as simple as, well, drinking water can be a um, um, sidestep because you are, um, you are not able to, um, to make that a priority. So, um, so yes, mental health has... Um, has a huge impact on health in general, but in, in diabetes, it actually, you know, the diagnosis of diabetes on its own puts you more at risk for mental health conditions. So it is a vicious cycle there. Um, so a few tips to uh, manage that. Um, exercise is really important. Um, studies show that just a 30 minute walk can have the same benefits um, as an antidepressive. Um, they actually found only a very slight difference between the two. Um, and um, they were really having a hard time uh, recommending medication for mild to moderate depression because walking was that effective. Mm -hmm. So I cannot stress that enough, I know pun intended, but yes, walking <laughs> is, um, is in incredible for our um, um, re relaxing our bodies, relaxing our mind. Um, walking in nature, is even more powerful. Um, that connection has also proven to relax the mind and relax the body. Um, practicing meditation, an interesting fact about that is that the more you practice meditation, the more you are um, helping your body understand what that feels like and you're more likely to relax faster the more you do it. So it's not that you're just relaxing because you've done the meditation, is that repeated action day in and day out allows your body to um, calm itself way faster. Just like a, a muscle would get stronger to exercise, very similarly to that, um, we can learn to get relaxed through, 
through uh, exercises. Even yoga, tai chi can function like that too, can have the same function. Um, other tips for that, um, connecting with community. Um, something else that um, has been really interesting um, is that, you know, in addition to specific lifestyle changes, like, you know, a healthy diet and exercise, uh, communities that um, are healthy, particular healthy communities, um, also shown to have a very good um, social element where connecting with your family and friends and having that um, closeness can help one stay healthier. So um, I would say develop those relationships, um, try to connect with your community. It doesn't have to be just family. Um, it can be any type of group that has similar goals. So, yes. Great, that's some really, um, really great tips there. And it's really that whole, um, the whole body, it's, it's healthy eating, um, it's, it's exercise, being active, and then it's that mind body awareness too, and taking that time. I think it's really interesting, you know, sharing that statistic of getting out and exercising is as good as some of these medications for depression. And oftentimes that might be the first thing that we do and realizing there's things we can um, do. We can get out there and getting out in nature is definitely um, really helpful and being, doing it with a friend, taking a walk with a friend, getting out in nature, um, are really important and looking at all of those things makes the whole, um, balance of that healthy lifestyle. So there are no more questions in the chat. I thought I wanted to still leave an opportunity for anything that either Sharon, Amy, or Irina, um, that you'd like to share any last words before we, um, start doing some of the wrap up for our session tonight. Yeah. I just had one other thing to add, even uh, I'm going to mention just the group support and I just see with people that you look like the people that are closest to you. So choosing um, people to be around you that are going to support your goals and support a healthy lifestyle. Um, Lucinda talked about it in her testimonial that she got that out of the diabetes prevention program. And I'm um, just thinking of another participant that we have um, currently in one of our cohorts that um, she newly moved to Reading, was looking for friends and um, needed some support to make it further in her goals. And um, she came to the group and shared that and, and left with a few phone numbers and people that she sees on a weekly basis. So, um, you know, it, all of these things tie together so that um, you know we can design our lives so that they're working for us um, you know getting that exercise in getting um, supportive people around us getting healthy things into our bodies and all that great any last words Irina or Sharon before we close out our session and I have a couple of things that I need to want to share as we wrap up, but anything I want to make sure that you have an opportunity if there's any final words. I know we did have a person coming from um, or a couple of people out of state. Um, our program at the Y here in Shasta County is the only one in our county that offers the diabetes prevention program, but it's a national program. So um, I just put it in the chat if you want to find uh, a program that's near you. So oh, I just wanted to to add because um, we we talked a lot about connecting with your um, healthcare team with your provider. I, I do think it's very important to advocate for your health for your own health. Um, and I feel like there's so many resources, but are as a patient sometimes you don't know what those resources are. And when it comes to um, to diet and um, weight um, maintenance. Um, if your doctor is recommending weight loss, I would highly encourage that you request to speak with a dietitian. Um, it's that's available for them as a typically they have that uh, option as a referral. So um, you you will get a lot more detailed advice uh, because your provider is limited. They only have about fifteen minutes to see you. So yes, that would be. 
that would be the last thing I just wanted to add. And I know Shasta Community Health Center does have uh, often a resource um, for people to be able to be referred to see a dietitian at that center, I know. Okay, well, um, if some questions come in before we completely wrap up, we will try to answer those. But I just wanted to make sure we had an opportunity um, to share about, we have an evaluation for today's event. Um, we'll be uh, placing a, a link to that evaluation in the chat box for you. And I'm also going to send out that evaluation to everyone in, in an email. Um, so complete that evaluation. You'll be entered into a drawing for either a one month um, Shasta Family YMCA membership or a $20 farmer's market um, gift certificate. And like I said, you'll also be emailed the link to this um, after the um, event. So I'm not sure I can try to put this um, into the chat too. So let me try to do that here. I think that link will go. Let me know if anyone has an issue with opening that up. Um, and then also I wanted to make sure that um, everyone uh, doesn't forget to pick up their prize bag. So everyone um, that's attended can pick up a prize bag at the Shasta Family YMCA um, between December 1st to the 9th. Anytime during their normal business hours, um, which ranges Monday through Friday, it's 5 a.m. to 9 p.m., Saturday at 7 a.m. to 6 p.m., and Sundays 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. So um, it'll be a you can pick up a prize bag from at their front desk, I believe, um, and just ask for the Let's Talk Prediabetes prize bag. I'm not sure, Amy, if there's any other thing they should ask for when they come by. Would that be okay? They just ask for their prize bag from the event. Yes, and uh, they'll be ready. So they'll be ready at noon um, tomorrow and then through the ninth during normal business hours. So yeah, if you just go to the front and let them know you're there to pick up your swag bag for the diabetes events, they'll be ready. Great, so we'll have that available. And just like I, I have on here, um, if you get a chance, go to the turnitaroundshasta.com and take the pre-diabetes risk test, um, talk to your doctor about that risk, and then looking into joining a lifestyle change program. And um, I, Amy had, and I think in, the, in our follow-up email that I'll um, send out with the evaluation, I'll make sure to include information um, that may have been shared in the chat um, today too, so that you also have that opportunity to have that, that information. So um, if there's no, I don't see any other questions. If there's nothing else, I just want to say thank you to everyone for taking the time to participate in our event. We hope it was helpful to you. And please reach out to us with any questions you might have. You can reach out in the contact um, page of the Turn It Around Shasta website. Um, I'll also put my email into the chat right now. Um, you can also just email me directly. If you have any questions about this event um, and just saying thank you and have a great rest of your evening. If there, I don't see anything else in the chat, I think we will end up closing our session. So thank you everyone. Really appreciate um, everyone taking the time and for our presenters and our speakers and for our host KIXE um, for really making this seamless for us and um, having this run through. Thank you to all of you too for making this happen. Um, thank you to all of our participants. All right. Have a good night, everyone.